Hello, hello. I welcome you to this uh, continuation lesson uh, where we are looking at uh, perioperative care. So in looking at perioperative care, in the first part of this lesson, we looked at uh, preoperative care. Now in this lesson, we are going to look at uh, um, we're going to look at emergency uh, preoperative care. We'll look at that and then we'll also look at intraoperative care precautions. Okay, so those are some of the things that we are going to look at. But to begin this lesson, what are some of the basic factors, okay, that may uh, constitute operative risks? So some of the basic factors that constitute oper uh, basic operative risk includes age over 70 years. What we mean by this is that if one is above 70 years, there is poor wound healing and there is low immunity. So if you conduct an operation uh, for someone who's above uh, 70 years or above 65 years, uh, the wound may take long to heal and you are likely to have a lot of complications. Then the other basic factors affecting operative risk is overall physical health and status. If uh, the person that is to be operated on has low immunity, it becomes very difficult uh, to conduct an operation because as you conduct an operation, uh, as you conduct an operation, the immunity may also go down or may further go down than the situation uh, than the way the situation was before. So overall physical health and health status. Operation affects patient's immunity because there's some blood which is lost, okay, meaning you have lost some uh, white cells there, okay, there's, so if you lose some of those cells and the fidgeting around with uh, internal organs and the likes uh, requires an immune response. So if one has got uh, uh, a poor overall physical health, then it may result in serious diseases. Then there's elective versus emergency surgery. Okay, so elective surgery, when we were discussing types of surgery, we said uh, this is a planned surgery. Then emergency surgery is surgery which should be done emergency or as an emergency. So it's important to know which surgeries should be done electively, which one should be done immediately. Okay. We also need the other operative risks that we need to consider are physiological extent of the disease. That is, the physiological extent of the disease, if we conduct an operation, how well is it helping the patient? Is it going to worsen the situation? Or is it going to help improve the situation? Is it going to provide some palliative uh, kind of relief to the patient? So the physiological extent of the disease if, for instance, the cancer has spread to all parts, then uh, doing a surgery may just uh, make uh, the condition to spread even faster. So in such conditions, it would not even be uh, advisable to do an operation. Then also associated illness. When you're about to conduct um, a surgery, it's important to take into consideration other associated illnesses that someone has. For instance, a patient with a gangrenous foot who has got diabetes, okay, diabetes uh, lowers the patient's immunity. So they are likely to have low immunity because they have a lot of sugar, which is, which is nutrient for bacteria. So you need to time your uh, surgery in such a way that the patient sugars are within normal range and they should not be high because of increased accessibility of the patient suffering from some other condition because of favorable glucose levels within the blood. Okay, so our concentration for this lesson is emergence pre-operative nursing care. And it's a continuation on the things that we looked at to do with the pre-operative care. So in emergency uh, pre-operative care, within this lesson, we are going to make a comparison, okay, of some main framework that you can use when you are nursing a patient, um, 
uh, we are nursing a patient with a, an emergency uh, pre-operative uh, condition. So you admit the patient to the surgical wards on an acute bay for easy monitoring and easy access to emergency care. The patient's environment uh, should have all the necessary equipment for patient resuscitation. This is an emergency. So get only relevant history for the patient's present condition. And this will be useful. This should be useful uh, in the follow-up care of the patient. Okay, so in emergency care, what is important, okay, what is important to come first is the resuscitation of the patient as you prepare simultaneously patients for surgery. So we are going to have resuscitation, okay, as the, one of the main um, interventions that are supposed to be done for emergency preoperative nursing care. So you have to do a quick assessment of level of consciousness and get a brief history concerning pain, where, when, and how, and also previous food that the patient had eaten. So this is what you do in the resuscitation. Okay, so remember pain, too much of it may cause a patient to be unconscious because of nature of accident that might have led to uh, this emergency condition. Okay, so where the pain is coming from is important. When it started, okay, and also previous food to rule out maybe allergic reaction that might have caused this unconscious state. So assess airway, breathing, circulation, and also the hydration status in an emergency situation. So resuscitation forms the priority of your framework in caring for the patient preoperatively. So in most emergencies, investigations are done at the same time with the resuscitative measures. Okay, so let us add more stick to do with the airway. So with airway in emergency pre-operative nursing care, you have to inspect the airway for blockage either by foreign body or secretion and make it patent by suctioning or repositioning of the patient. You have to clean uh, the vomitus if the patient, let's say, is vomiting because they may block uh, the airway. So you have to ensure that you clean the vomitus with a clean cloth Okay, and also avoid traumatizing the airway as you remove the secretion because it may compromise uh, air exchange. Then breathing. Okay, in the ABC, within your framework of resuscitation, you take care of breathing. So with breathing, we are saying observe the rising and falling of the chest wall and listen to breathing sounds. You can count the respiration per minute for baseline data. Observe the nasal flaring and cyanosis resulting from insufficient oxygen perfusion to the tissue due to obstructed airway. Check blood oxygen saturation as baseline and also commence supplemental oxygen therapy by nasal catheter or mask at five liters per minute for an adult. Then initiate breathing with ambubag where chest movements are absent. So these are some of the things that you can do for the airway. You can also do cardiac massage to stimulate cardiopulmonary activity, intubate with endotracheal tube where necessary and connect patient to mechanical ventilator for artificial respiration. Of course, this is where condition states. You can inspect the nasogastric tube to decompose the abdomen in cases of abdominal distension. This will promote a full lung expansion as abdominal organs may, pr may press on the thoracic cage affecting it uh, easy breathing. Okay, so A, B, now C is for circulation in our emergency pre-operative care. So C, circulation, 
check the pulse and blood pressure to rule out hypovaremic shock, ascertain the level of dehydration by checking for skin tagger and sucking eyes or dry lips. You can assess intravenous line and commence a fluid infusion to restore intravascular volume and collect shock. Okay, so you can give a plasma expander to collect shock in them, in, in, that is in case the patient is in, in shock. Intravenous fluid also corrects fluid and electric imbalance and also provides nutritional maintenance during periods of no oral intake. Okay, so patients will be new per oral, okay, as they are due for surgery. Okay, they are new per oral to prevent paralytic areas because if you have food in the stomach, it can act as a source of infection. Okay, so and so you try to avoid paralytic areas because peristalsis is also affected by anesthetic drugs. So continue monitoring the pulse and blood pressure every 15 uh, minutes prior to taking the patient to theater. Because patient who comes in an emergency, you can easily lose them. So you have to do quarter, uh, quarter, quarter, quarter hourly investigation. Okay, you have to do observation every 15 minutes before you take the patient to theater. Okay, the foot end of the bed will be elevated to promote blood flow to the vital organs, especially in instances where a patient is bleeding. So you have to improve blood circulation to the vital organs. The patient will be covered with extra linen. This is to keep them warm and we are avoiding hypothermia, okay? Then in an emergency, the pre-operative preparation is limited to basic essentials. When the patient is in shock or is bleeding, the hemoglobin is checked and blood grouping is done. The intravenous infusion is also inserted using normal saline or plasma expanders until compatible whole blood is available. Okay, so now with uh, the ABCs, of emergency pre-operative elaborated, then investigations comes in. So investigation, the mnemonic is HP comp lab. H for history, okay? H for history. P for physical examination, inspection, percussion, okay? Okay, inspection, percussion, palpation, those. Then comp computerized investigations that is supposed to be done. Computerized investigation includes X-ray uh, scan. Then lab investigations includes uh, hemoglobin level checking and uh, um, other samples that you take for laboratory testing. So investigations here they are done simultaneously with the, the resuscitative measures because we are dealing with a pre-op emergency. So you do a full blood count to check, uh, to do a full blood count to check also hemoglobin levels. You do grouping and cross match. Uh, you also do a clotting time study and also take specimen for urinalysis, which will help to rule out diabetes. And also, it is uh, if unable to pass urine, the patient you can catheterize and take the urine sample so that uh, you can uh, test the urine sample to rule out diabetes. But you can also take a blood sample for random blood glucose to rule out uh, to rule out diabetes. Then um, nutrition: the patient who has come in an emergency state will still not take anything by mouth. Okay, during the diagnostic period. Okay, this is in anticipation for surgery. If the patient had eaten anything within two hours, then a nasogastric tube should be passed, okay, should be passed to evacuate the stomachy uh, content. Okay, if patient ate less than two hours, okay, the there's risk of paralytic areas. There is risk of patient vomiting on the theater table, bringing about contamination. So in case of intestinal obstruction, a nasogastric tube or duodenal tube is passed and intent in suction started in order to keep the stomach or duodenum 
free of fluid and gases. So we are still maintaining new the oral for emergency. And if patient had eaten less than two hours, you do a gastric decompression. So the tube is left in situ for continuous drainage and intravenous fluids are given as prescribed. This is to maintain fluid and electric balance and prevent hypovolemic shock. Lingers lactate will help to help normalize the electrolyte balance of the patient. Normal saline can help to normalize blood pressure of the patient. Observations or pre-op emergency. Observe general condition of the patient, check vitals. Vitals will mean temperature, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure. Okay, so pressure, these are to be monitored to rule out shock. If blood pressure is too low, maybe signs of shock. Okay, temperature to rule out any signs of infections. Psychological care. You can explain the condition and the disease process to the patients and the parents or the people that the guardians that might have brought the patient. So you can explain the necessity of immediate surgery, that it is the only alternative. You explain the nature of the operation and also any member of the surgical team can help with the psychological care. You can allay anxiety and ensure that the patients and the parents are agreeable to the operation. Okay, patients, if at all they meet the age, legal age level, they can be made to sign the consent. Okay, or you can um, have any other person who, by legal prescription, can help sign the consent. Then skin preparation. This is preparation of local area, which we also discussed in the in uh, uh, pre-op care. That is for general pre-op care. So skin preparation. Preoperative skin care is given in order to have the skin as free as possible from dirty particles, hair cells, uh, secretions, and organisms. So simply preoperative. Preoperatively, the skin needs to be cared for in order to reduce microbes. Cleaning of the skin with antiseptic soap and shaving of the skin are done to reduce the population of microbes. In an emergency situation to do with elimination as part of the framework of our nursing care, is that the urinary bladder should be emptied to prevent urinary retention during induction and operation. In case of low abdominal or pelvic, uh, that is in law of um, in case of low abdominal or pelvic surgery, a full bladder may interfere with the surgical procedure by making the site less accessible, and it may increase the risk of accidental injury to the bladder wall. So, in such instances, catheterize the patient. You can also administer enema. Okay, to reduce the amount of um, matter that is uh, fecal matter that is in the lectum, you can catheterize in order to, to avoid surgical errors because the bladder is affecting the access to the other organ. You can catheterize patient for continuous emptying of the bladder to prevent bladder injury during uh, surgery. Okay, then a pre-medication, which was also uh part of our general pre-op care so pre-medication is also important in emergency situation in the a b c d so the main purpose of pre-medication is to reduce anxiety and to reduce secretion of saliva and gastric juices okay or reduce gastric volume and acidity to prevent or reduce nausea okay nausea and vomiting and also when you prevent this, you are preventing infection on the theater table because when the patient vomits, it may introduce an infection. Then, labeling of the patient or identity band. Okay, so the patient is uh, given an identity band which carries the name, age, diagnosis, word, type of operation, and type of anesthesia. This is to prevent surgical error and some drugs 
uh, will depend on the weight for calculation. So that is why it is important to have this or the identity band. The name, age, and the, the diagnosis. Removal of the jewelry and other items. So dentures are removed to prevent choking. Glasses or artificial lenses should also be removed and kept well. The jewelry, okay, is a dangerous uh, is dangerous if let's say you're using a diathem machine. It can bring about the electrocution. So it's important to remove jewelry. If patients, uh, let's say for females mostly, but even males sometimes use nail polish, you need to remove the nail polish for easy observation for cyanosis. Okay, patient readiness now for theater. You can uh, ensure that the patient puts on the gown. This is to reduce the uh, introduction of infection in the ward as the gown is sterile. Then check vitals to act as baseline data. Okay, you can collect the notes of the patient so that you can give proper handover about the patient and explain to the patient that is going to take him to theater while escorting him, okay, to the theater department. Okay, then after you have given handover to theater nurse, you will have to come back and make a post of bed. When you make a post of bed, this ends the pre-operative care, whether emergency pre-operative care or general operative care. It ends at making the post-operative bed where you're going to receive the patient. Okay, so now with that said, let's have a comparison between elective and emergency surgery. So to discuss this, we are going to look at emergency pre-operative care and elective care. So in emergency uh, pre-operative care, we talk of admission of the patient. So even in elective pre-operative care, we talk about admission of the patient. In emergency, there's admission of the patient that you need to look at. So applies in the elective pre-operative. Then in emergency pre-operative, there is a assessment or resuscitation that will constitute air with breathing and circulation. Why is in an elective surgery, there is psychological care. There is also psychological care in pre-operative care, but you know, the admission process, when once you finish the admission process for an emergency care, you go right into the station and this can be done simultaneously okay so investigations have to be done so the emergency investigation that can be done in emergency uh, pre-operative care so even in the elective care that is elective pre-operative care uh, investigations have to be done okay so investigation but not the emergency investigations like the ones that you might have there, but because you would have done um, the investigations uh, like way before the operation is done, okay? Or whilst in emergency, they have to be done right there and then. Okay, so we have mentioned consent form. In all situations, consent form has to be signed, okay? Nutrition status uh, here, for emergency, there can be need to put NGT to remove uh, content, gastric content. Whilst in elective surgery, um, patients should have the right nutrition status fit to make them fit to go for surgery. In all emergency and elective observations are done. Pre-medication is given. Elimination needs to be taken care of. Okay, whilst in emergency, there is emptying of the blood duct, you catheterize and the likes. Even in elective surgery, you can catheterize the patient. But uh, in elective surgery, starve patients six to eight hours before. Whilst in emergency situation, there is no time to starve the patient, but enema can be administered, especially if you are doing lower abdominal surgery. Skin preparation in both will be done. ID band in both, it is applicable. Theater gowning in both, it's applicable. Handover. It's applicable in both, and preparation of um, post-operative bed is applicable in both. So just to expand a little bit more on what we have just been saying, okay, how 
uh, emergency surgery and the elective surgery is similar. So elective surgery, we're just looking at general preoperative care. So history taking in an emergency situation, there's no time for preparation. Get only relevant history for the patient's present condition that is useful for resuscitation, okay, and approach for surgery. But when you're talking of, of about elective surgery, there's more time for preparation. You can get all the history pertaining the patient. What is to do with social history, uh, environmental history, family history, past medical history, present medical history. You can, so you have all the time to get all that. So in emergency situation, we only get vital, uh, vital history. Okay, that will help you to uh, conduct the procedure. Whilst in here, uh, in elective surgery. It is a, a little bit comprehensive history that you can get. Resuscitation. In emergency situation, you check vital function, that is the ABCs, immediately after getting relevant history directed uh, so that you can, it can help you direct your intervention towards uh, the anomaly that the patient has. You can open an intravenous line, okay, for intravenous fluid and administration of blood. Whilst in an elective surgery, the patient does not need any resuscitation at all. But pre-medication may be given when the time is due. That is night before the operation. Okay. But you can also cannulate the patient for administration of IV fluids. Okay. In the elective surgery. So this is what we can talk about to do with comparison similarities or dissimilarities that may exist. Then psychological care in emergency situation gives psychological care to the patients while preparing him for surgery if conscious. If unconscious em emphasis is directed to the relatives both during pre uh, during preparing the patient and when the patient is in theater. In elective surgery to do with psychological care Psychological care can come from the doctor, nurse, anesthetist, or any member of the surgical team. Okay, fellow, um, fellow patients who successfully underwent a similar operation can be uh, brought to speak to the patient about the procedure to help allay anxiety. Hospital chaplain or pastor or any religious leader of the patient's choice can be brought to offer spiritual support to the patient. Okay, to do with consent uh, form, in emergency situation, you can quickly explain the importance of signing the consent to the patient if conscious. Okay, so you can let the patient sign if conscious and is also above 18 years with a sound mind. Okay, in emergency situation, relatives can sign consent if patient is unconscious and if no relatives the surgeon can sign on patient's behalf now in elective surgery to do with consent form the consent form remains valid for two weeks so the patient can even sign a day before surgery or on the actual day of surgery okay so now uh, to do with the emergency surgery investigations, you can make a very quick appraisal of the patient's physical condition. You can consider hemoglobin count, grouping and close match, random blood sugar, okay, and emergency X-ray. Why is for elective surgery, all ordered investigations for both diagnosis and uh, ruling out any anomalies should be done. Weight can be checked to ascertain the patient's nutritional status and acting as baseline uh, data. Okay, so for drugs that may require, uh, require body mass. So investigation, you can see how these are similar to do with the emergency and elective surgery. So in emergency surgery, uh, to do with skin preparation, uh, you can shave if, if a patient's condition allows, or depending on the area that is being in, uh, that, is being, that is to be operated on. So clean the uh, patient with antiseptic concentration on the incision site or site where the operation will be 
uh, will be done. At times, shaving can be done even in theatre, depending on the degree of uh, the emergency. So you can identify the patient, remove variables immediately, and remove prosthetic uh, prosthesis immediately. In uh, elective surgery, you remove variables before bathing the patient. Bath the patient using antiseptic soap and clean the patient with antiseptic on the incision site. Identity of the patient uh, is done and removal of prosthesis and nail polish can be done. Okay, so to do with bowel preparation and bladder care in emergency situation, you can consider nasogastric in emergency situation, inserting a nasogastric tube can give intravenous antibiotics for prophylaxis and countercheck doctor's orders. You can catheterize the patient and you have to use the indwelling catheter. So you catheterize the patient. In, uh, for bowel preparation and bladder care in elective surgery, you can starve the patient six to eight hours, okay, before surgery. And you can administer enema or laxatives if you not contraindicated. You can administer prescribed antibiotics to sterilize the bowel. You can counter check the doctor's orders and tell the patient to avoid 30 minutes prior to surgery. And then you can also catheterize just like him in emergency. Do with gowning. You can gown the patient if the gown is within reach and ready. And elective surgery, this. Uh, you can still gown eh, the patient. Okay, so we've been looking at the comparison between elective and emergency surgery. So emergency surgery, emergency preparation. Elective surgery requires general preparation. So these are similar. The difference is that in emergency surgery, you need to uh, prioritize resuscitation of the patient and you need to do all those things that have to be done in an emergency situation. Whilst in elective surgery, you just need to do general preparation. Okay, so we have up to now looked at emergency preparation of the patient and we have looked at emergency surgery and elective, su uh, elective surgery, how they are similar. So we have made a comparison. Okay, so now with that now discussed, we can now look at patient transfer to the surgical suit. So in looking at patient to the surgical suit here, meaning we are now starting the next phase of, uh, of perioperative care, which is the intraoperative care. Care, why, care during surgery. Okay, so this phase begins when the patient is transferred to the operating room table and ends when the patient is admitted to post-anesthesia care unit. It involves management of uh, patients in the operating theater. The purpose of intraoperative care is to maintain patient safety and comfort during surgical procedure. Some of the goals of intraoperative care includes maintaining homeostasis uh, during procedure, maintaining strict sterile techniques to decrease uh, chances of cross infection, ensuring that the patient is secure on the operating table and taking measures to prevent hematomas from, safe, uh, from safety trips. Okay, the other uh, reasons or measures as to why intraoperative care is important is that nursing activities uh, during this phase also includes monitoring the patient's vitals, blood oxygenation levels, also monitoring fluid therapy, medication, anesthesia, okay, and also retrieving samples for laboratory tests. So these are some of the nursing activities that a nurse may, uh, may be required to do during this uh, during or intraoperative phase. Intraoperative care is provided by the surgical team. Surgical team includes the nurse and, and the anesthetist, the surgical technicians and the surgeon. Okay, and all other cleaners that may might be working from theater. So 
there we are looking at the surgical team. So, so the list that we are just giving you here is C, uh, the list of who? the surgical team or members of the surgical team. Okay, so intraoperative care precautions. Why look at intraoperative care precautions? We are trying to avoid surgical accidents. Okay, so it's important so that these intraoperative care precautions are at your fingertip as a nurse when you are working in theater. So uh, the first uh, precaution that we're going to talk about as a nurse, you need to make sure that you take note of the following precautions. Patient undergoing surgery most often are given some type of anesthesia. So the administration of general anesthesia has a lasting effect on, on the patient's body, which can suppress cardiovascular function or heighten cardiovascular irritability. So it may also result in respiratory depression, loss of consciousness, paralysis, and lack of cessation. So these effects mean that the patient is in a very vulnerable or critical position. It is the responsibility of a nurse, okay, with uh, the healthcare team in the operating room to maintain patient safety and yet uh, facilitate uh, uh, facilitate a good uh, surgical operation. So ventilation should be assessed by the nurse for continuous uh, for continu ventilation should be assessed by the nurse for continuous auscultation of breath sounds and also oxygenation should also be assessed or monitored. Okay, so this is to ensure that vitals are continuously normal. Okay, then um, continuous electrocardiography, that is the showing of the heart function, should be in place and the patient and the nurse should look at the patient's heart rate and blood pressure so that they are within normal range. Any sudden increase in blood pressure may be a sign that patient is in pain. Okay, so it's important for the nurse to note this. Means to monitor the patient's temperature must be available immediately for use. In case of an emergency backup personnel who experts in airway management, emergency intubation, and advanced cardiac life support must be available. So all means here we're saying of you taking vitals should be available in order for you to know that the parameters that have been taken are indicative that the patient is in a stable situation. Okay, so an emergency kit containing the necessary supplies and equipment must be immediately accessible. The patient should be checked uh, should be checked to ensure proper function and in lengthy procedures, areas of operating table that come into contact with the patient's bony prominences must be padded to prevent skin trauma and hematomas. Okay, so during a surgical procedure, many instruments, drapes, and sponges are used. Also, a multitude of care providers may be working in the operating field, performing different tasks. So it is the responsibility of the nurse to work in the operating room so that they maintain an accurate count of all sponges, instruments, and shafts that may become foreign bodies upon incision and closure. Okay, so with that, then we look if the nurses, let's say, fails to make accurate counts of these sponges and the likes, then they can be held legally accountable. Okay, they can be held legally or they can be held liable for such a mistake. Most surgical procedures are invasive and compromise patient skin integrity. This increases the risk of infection and uh, infection and disease. And uh, this risk, uh, this means that the nurse should ensure that um, sterile technique are observed throughout uh, the procedure. Okay, then um, the ventilation system in the operating suit must be efficient, okay, and temperature 
maintained 20 to 23 degrees, then relative humidity should be at 30 to 60 percent. The healthcare personnel who work in the operating room must not be permitted to work if they have open regions on the hands or arms or have eye infections, uh, diarrhea, or respiratory infections because they may be a source of infection uh, to the patient. Scrub attire must be worn by all personnel entering the operating room. Fresh scrub attire must be washed and ironed daily. If um, heavily sold uh, during one case, they should be changed uh, before the next case. Shoes should be changed often or cleaned. Head and facial hair must be completely contained, okay, by wearing a cape, okay, or there's a cape that is worn in theater. Okay, then a proper fitting disposable surgical mask must be worn at all times and discarded immediately after use. Sterile gloves and sterile gowns must be worn by those working in and that is working in and area proximal to the sterile field. A careful skin preparation with appropriate antiseptic solution is formed on patient's arrival to the operating area. Intraoperative complications are complications uh, surgery related to anesthesia or position related should be avoided at all costs. One complication which can be life threatening is an aphrastic reaction to anesthesia. Another anesthesia related complication is called awareness under anesthesia, which occurs when the patient receives uh, sufficient, let's say, muscle relaxant to prohibit voluntary motor function, but insufficient sedation and the anesthesia to block pain and sense of hearing. So excessive breathing during operation may result due to cutting of major blood vessels or poor ligation. And this may also be a complication in the intraoperative phase. So there you have it. Today we have just looked at emergency care of a patient that is about to undergo surgery. Okay, so we have looked at emergency care and then we have also looked at intraoperative precautions and complications that may arise. So from me, I'm saying thank you and keep studying.